Hello and welcome to Historical Highlights of the Lutheran Service Book Companion to the Hymns. I'm Peter Reske, Senior Editor of Music and Worship at Concordia Publishing House and one of the general editors of the Companion to the Hymns. Let's get this screen up. Okay. Now the Lutheran Service Book Companion to the Hymns obviously is the Companion to Lutheran Service Book, the hymnal that came out in 2006. Um, the Companion came out in December of 2019. Now, my co-editors, co-editors on the Companion were Joseph Hurl and John Viker. And very early on in the project, we established that we wanted to do the research a little differently than, um, than had been done with previous Companions. So this is the methodology that we adopted. These um, some some basic principles that resulted in, I should say, 2,813 texts, translations, tunes, and settings, 1,527 unique primary sources collected from 308 libraries and digital repositories. So I started to talk about the methodology. The, the, this was the result. The methodology was, was basically this. Rather than rely on previous hymnal companions where they would uh, give some information, say a hymn came from here, its text came from here, its translation came from here, and just rely on that, we decided that in every case, for every hymn, for every text, for every translation, every tune, every setting, harmonization, we wanted to look at the primary source. We wanted to see it, verify it, and collect further information from it. And so that, that work took about a decade, resulted in collecting these 2,800 texts, translations, etc., more than 1,500 unique primary sources collected from more than 300 different libraries and archives, etc. Now, what does this look like in practice? Here are some pages from the companion. This is what the companion looks like. So if you go to hymn 709, the king of love my shepherd is, you'll find the text background. And this is what you will typically find in a hymnal companion. A little bit of information about the background of the hymn, when it was written, maybe why it was written, and you get that. And so you see over here, our text background section. Then we also add a text commentary section and the text commentary digs deeper uh, into like theological commentary, scripture references, things like that. Then we add something that really sets our companion apart. And that is the historical summary. In addition to categorizing the hymns, we, as I said, looked at the primary sources and collected this kind of information. Um, we weren't satisfied to look at a previous companion that says, the King of Love My Shepherd Is was written by Henry W. Baker based on, modeled on Psalm 23 com and coming from Hymns Ancient and Modern, 1868. We wanted to see it for ourselves. So we collected those sources. So here we can see Hymns Ancient and Modern, the appendix from 1868. And at Hymn 330, there is the king of love my shepherd is. And in our book, the way it works is we pull in that information, the author, Henry W. Baker, model, source, hymns A&M, 1868, number 330, yep. Section, general hymns, heading, the Lord is my shepherd. First line, the king of love my shepherd is. Stanzas. Six stanzas, and LSB uses one through six. That is, LSB uses all six. And then for their comments, usually when there's differences between the source text and what appears in LSB. So here we see that one line in LSB differs from the 1868 text. Stanza five, line two, thy unction grace bestoweth. And we'll find it here, one, two, three, four, five, line two. Thy unction grace bestoweth. By the time it reaches LSB has become thine unction grace bestoweth. And we highlight the changes with the italic type. Um, 
This is a really, really simple example. It's really straightforward. We use all six stanzas. Only one word has been changed. Um, oh, I should also mention that just because there's a change here, it doesn't necessarily mean that LSB made the change. Um, it's possible that the change was made at some other point and that's, that's how LSB received it. This is a very simple example. Let's look at a slightly more complex example. How about him 590 in LSB, baptized into your name most holy. So this is a four stanza German hymn that has been translated into English. The German, the German hymn originally comes from Johann Jakob Rambach's Erbauliches Handbüchlein für Kinder, published in 1734. You can see here the title page. Here on page 106 and 107 is our hymn, stanza one, Ich bin getauft auf deinen Namen. Stanza two, stanza three, stanza four, stanza five. You'll also notice, um, maybe even if you don't read German, there are these little asterisks and they're pointing out specific um, scripture references connected with words or, or lines in the stanzas. Anyway, stanzas one, two, three, four, five, turn the page, six and seven. So in our historical summary, we point out that Rombach's original had seven stanzas and LSB uses stanzas one and two, four and five, those four stanzas. So we have to do all of that for the German, then we do it again for the English translation. The English comes from Catherine Winkworth's Chorale Book for England from 1863. And you can see here stanza one and then stanzas two through six. Um, this is a different tune than the tune we use with this text in Lutheran Service Book, by the way. Um, the model of this hymn is interesting. So remember I mentioned, we'll point out when there are models like the King of Love My Shepherd is, being based on Psalm 23. Winkworth's model in this case was another hymn that she had translated. Um, well, mo more precisely, another translation she had done of this hymn. In 1858, in, a, in an earlier publication, she had translated the same hymn, Rombach's hymn, but did not follow the original meter of the, of the German. So she redid it in 1863, following that original meter. And so we have it here. Now, what does this look like uh, when the information comes into, comes into our companion? You'll see there are a lot more changes with Winkworth. Time hasn't necessarily been kind um, to Winkworth's hymns. Um, so for example, stanza one has three, three changes, stanza two, one, two, three, four, five, six, every line in stanza two has something different about it. Um, in this case, it's, it's not, not a, a huge difference. My loving father here doth take me, my loving father here you take me. Um, but we lay out all, all of the changes, all of the differences, and we do this with every hymn, not just the texts, not just the translations, but the tunes and settings as well. Now, in the course of working, working through this project over the last decade, some, some really interesting, exciting, even fun things have turned up. Um, and I'd like to highlight some of those today. So let's get to the first one. A hymn that is familiar to many of us, Thy Strong Word Did Cleave the Darkness, LSB 578. Now think of the hymn in Lutheran Service Book. It has six stanzas. It was written in the 1950s. Um, this one should be pretty straightforward. We don't have to go back to German and translation. Um, we don't have to work with, uh, you know, across multiple centuries. In fact, I'm here in St. Louis and the hymn was written here in St. Louis. I don't even have to tra travel outside of the city. But as it turns out, it, it's not that straightforward. We know that Martin Franzman wrote the hymn in 1954 
at the request of Walter Buzin. Walter Buzin had come across the hymn tune, Ebenezer, and asked Franzman to write a text for it. Franzman took as his theme for the hymn, the motto of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, where both men worked. And the motto in Greek is anothen tophos, that is light from above. And knowing that theme, you can definitely see it coming out in the, in the text of the hymn. So Franzman wrote the hymn for a chapel service on October 7th, 1954. And we have the little mimeographed sheet that was handed out for people to sing the hymn on that day. We'll take a look at it here. We remember that the hymn in Lutheran Service Book has six stanzas. Here, the hymn only has four. So immediately, this is going to be a more interesting, a more interesting problem than we, than we thought. Four stanzas for this chapel service on October 7th, 1954. Oh, incidentally, there was reportedly a recording done of this chapel service specifically so that they could preserve for posterity the first singing of this hymn. But we haven't been able to find this recording yet. Now, a short while later, already in 1955, so remember the, the, the first, first chapel use was October 1954. Already in 1955, Buzin asked Franzman to write another stanza because they wanted to use the hymn as a processional and they needed it to be a little longer. Very practical reason. So Franzman provided this stanza and here we have a memo from Walter Buzin, I'm sorry, to Walter Buzin from Martin Franzman in Franzman's hand. And it says, cross stanza for anothen tofos. And then this part in parentheses is really important. It says, after low on men who dwelt in darkness. What Franzman is doing, he's indicating where in, in the sequence of stanzas, this new stanza gets inserted. So he's saying it goes after the stanza that begins, low on men who dwelt in darkness. And then we have the stanza, from the cross thy wisdom shining, breaketh forth in conquering might. From the cross forever beameth all thy bright, redeem, bright redeeming light. Alleluia, etc. Uh, while this memo is undated, we think it's probably from 1955 because we have from 1955 the seminary service book, a little booklet they had put together for use at chapel and other things like that. And here's how the hymn appears in the 1955 seminary service book. It has five stanzas, but look at the stanzas and the order they, they appear. Stanza one, thy strong word did cleave. Stanza two, low on men. Now, according to the memo, after the stanza, low on men, should come the cross stanza from the cross. But instead, it appears in position five. What happened here? Um, was this a mistake? You know, was, was somebody just laying it out, put the stanzas in the wrong order? Maybe. Uh, it was laid out with stanzas one, two, three, and four, and then later, maybe at the last minute, some kind of thing. This is all conjecture, but maybe then stanza five from the cross got appended at the end. But I think it's pretty clear from Franzman's memo that the that stanza doesn't go in that final position. Also, when you consider um, kind of the theme and the structure of the hymn and its flow, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to go from give us lips to sing thy glory, fill our songs with alleluias, alleluias, plural, without end, and then jump back to from the cross, alleluia, without end, the way the other stanzas are. Um, it's an anomaly. We haven't found anything else that have, have had this, the, the stanzas in this particular order. Now, as I said, there are six stanzas in LSB and we've still only encountered for five of them. In 1959, 
for commencement at the seminary, this is the service folder, Franzman wrote a sixth doxological stanza and it definitely goes at the end. Here, here is the page from the service folder from the 1959 commencement ceremonies at the seminary in St. Louis. So in the course of its just five years at this point, the hymn had gone from four stanzas to five with a question about where that, that new stanza goes. And then um, now a sixth stanza. We looked at um, commencement ser service folders, uh, opening service folders at the beginning of the service year because for years and years at the opening services of the seminary school year and at commencement, they, they would sing this hymn. And by doing that, we were kind of able to trace um, the, the path of these stanzas and, and how they moved around. So in the book, in, in the companion, in the companion to the hymns, we give this table, we lay out the six stanzas when they appeared and the order they, they come in, at least as far as we've been able to tell, based on manuscripts, memos, seminary service books, some other sources, and especially the commencement and opening service bulletins and service folders. So here's how you read this table. Uh, Lutheran service book order and stanzas running across, this, across the top. So the manuscript from 1954 that we saw only had four stanzas in this order, thy strong word, stanza one, low on men, stanza two, thy strong word bespeaks, stanza three, and give us lips, stanza four. The memo, while it doesn't list specifically the other four st stanzas, it tells you that from the cross should be in position three after number two, low on men. The seminary service book we saw has, that, has, them, uh, has, has the cross stanza in this kind of particularly particularly strange spot, which turns out to be an anomaly. So as we move along, we're tracing the path of this cross stanza. Now at commencement and opening services, um, the cross stanza moves to position three, which apparently is where Franzman originally intended it. Starting with commencement in 1959, we see uh, the doxological stanza is here, it wasn't there before then. But in some undated sources, including a fair copy autograph manuscript by Franzman, the stanza order that we have now appears. A handful of sources, including a, a manuscript copy by Franzman, has, has the cross stanza in position four. Um, also, it appeared that way in Worship Supplement in 1969, while Franzman was still alive and then was carried forward in subsequent hymnals that way and was continued that way for, for decades at commencement and opening services. That's how it comes to us in LSB. Now, let's talk about that doxological stanza. It is, an, it is a truly outstanding, outstanding doxological stanza. In fact, one commentator has called it the greatest doxology ever written in any language. Now, having said that, I would like to point out that a handful of hymnals, all of them non-Lutheran, but a handful of hymnals only use four stanzas of this hymn when it appears in those hymnals. Um, I'm guessing it's just because they wanted to shorten it up a bit. Maybe they're not doing processions for opening services or commencement. Um, and so they reduce it to just these four stanzas, one, two, three, and six. And this makes sense, um, the, the first three, and then jump to the final doxological stanza. But let us remember that in Franzman's original conception of the hymn, stanza five, give us lips, was the original final stanza. 
So when it was only four hymns, or, or when the hymn was only four stanzas, rather, that was how Franzman had it. So I would say, think about this. If you are going to sing the hymn and you want to reduce the stanzas, if, maybe only do one, two, three, and four. And like I said, that doxological stanza is pretty great. Um, and you would probably have to answer to congregation members who are saying, you know, why didn't we sing the doxological stanza? Or why didn't we sing all six stanzas? But something to think, think about. Take a few minutes and look at the structure of the stanzas and how neatly the structure and the theme of the hymn is all tied up in stanza five. Think about that. Okay, as I said, we did the research on texts and translations, but we also did it with tunes. Let's take a look at a familiar tune. Milwaukee, LSB 341. This is one of two tunes in LSB that we use with the text, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. Now here is the tune as it appears in TLH from 1941, where it was the third tune for this text. And you'll see the credit up there in the top right, here where it says, August Lemke, 1849. So they credit the tune to August Lemke, having written it in 1849. We, we wanted to know more. We wanted, a, a, as we did with, with every tune, we wanted to see that source from 1849 for ourselves and record its information in our book for you. We couldn't find any, anything, any source from 1849 with this tune by August Lemke. And so we looked in the handbook to TLH, its companion, and there it says about the tune that it's known in our circles as the Milwaukee tune. And of course, uh, in subsequent hymnals, it, that becomes the tune name, Milwaukee. And the biography for August Lemke in that book, the handbook to TLH, it says that he was a teacher in, and organist at Trinity Lutheran Church in Milwaukee from 1847 to 1851. And it says that he wrote this hymn while he was in, or wrote this tune rather, while he was in service there. So my question is, is 1849 a real date? Did they see something, a published thing, maybe a manuscript with the date 1849 on it? Or based on their information that, or their, their belief that he worked at Trinity in Milwaukee from 1847 to 51, did they just pick the midpoint date in that period and put 1849 on it? I don't know. What we then tried to do was trace back the earliest place we could find this tune and the earliest place we could find it credited to August Lemke. The earliest place we could find the tune is the Evangelisches Lutherisches Choralbuch, published in St. Louis, not by CPH, published by St. Louis around 1883. This book was used, was used around the Missouri Synod. CPH had not yet, had not yet, yet published a choralbuch, a book of tunes and settings for, for the organist to use with the hymnal. So this is from 1883. We're almost 40 years after when, it, when the tune was said to have been written. And this is the, the first time we can find its appearance. And there is no mention of August Lemke having written this tune. In fact, there's no cre credit at all for this tune. It appears again in 1908 in this CPH publication, the Concordia Kinderkura. Here we have the tune. There is no credit of the composer but you'll see up here, it says arranged by SFG. SFG is Samuel Frederick Glazer, who is one of the editors of this book. And if you want to learn more about him, um, get the Companion to the Hymns. Volume two has all the biographies of all the composers and writers. Um, and we have a nice complete biography of him. 
but he did not write the tune. He just wrote the setting. And it's worth, it's worth pointing out this setting because this is the setting that we use in LSB. Um, it's the setting that TLH picked up and, and then found its way to LSB. The next place we find the tune, the Milwaukee tune, is in this little Christmas Vesper service. Now this service was published in kind of two pieces. What you see here is the title page of the text only edition, and it came with a little music edition. These things are just booklets. They're, they're really little things. It's, it's just, just one Christmas service. The music edition for this service has the, the Milwaukee tune. What's interesting is what this title page tells us about the service. It tells us that it's by J. Wegner. Um, it's undated, but based on some other evidence, including when it was reviewed in Der Lutheraner, we believe that it was written around 1912. I should say published around 1912. The liturgy, this little Christmas liturgy, is dedicated on its title page to the mixed choir of Trinity Lutheran Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, dedicated by its long-serving director, Johann Wegner. Now, this is a connection with Trinity in Milwaukee, but unfortunately, it doesn't say anything about August Lemke, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't say, oh, this is the tune that we've used at our church for the last 60 years or something like that. Nope. The first place we finally see the tune appear with Lemke's name on it is CPH's music reader for Lutheran schools published in 1933. We're almost a hundred years beyond when Lemke is said to have written it. And this is the first time we see his name associated with it. You see here, A. Lemke. This book was co-edited by Bernhard Schumacher. Why is that important? Why is that significant? Well, there's two things you need to know about Bernhard Schumacher. He was the secretary for the Intersynodical Committee that produced TLH in 1941. In fact, he was the chairman of the subcommittee on tunes. And he, he is thought to have been largely responsible for a lot of the musical settings, the harmonizations in TLH. More on those settings later. So the first thing we need to remember about Bernhard Schumacher is that he was closely connected with TLH and two, the second thing we need to remember is that he spent the majority of his career in, you guessed it, Milwaukee. Schumacher was born in Watertown, Wisconsin, and then served from 1911 to 1925 at Emanuel Lutheran Church in Milwaukee, and from 1925 to 1959, served as the superintendent of schools for the South Wisconsin District. So he, he was a teacher and musician in Milwaukee and then largely connected with all of the churches and especially their schools across, across the South Wisconsin district. So he is the one who credits this tune to August Lemke and probably carries that information forward to TLH. The question is, what did he know that we don't? Did he, ha did he have a source in front of him? Um, Schumacher came to teach in Milwaukee in 1911, and August Lemke was still alive. August Lemke died in West Dallas, Wisconsin in 1913. So I suppose it's possible that Schumacher could have met Lemke. Maybe Lemke said, of course, I'm the one who wrote that. I did it for Christmas in 1849. Um, or Schumacher became aware of just the kind of oral tradition surrounding this tune that was really popular around Milwaukee. We still don't know. 
So your assignment, see if you can find an earlier publication of this tune with Lemke's name on it. If you do, let me know. How about another tune? Oh, Grosser Gott. Not Grosser Gott, wir loben dich. Holy God, we praise thy name. Oh, Grosser Gott. Oh, God of God, oh, light of light. We used this tune two times in LSB at 538 and 810. Now, let's look at its appearance in TLH. Here's the tune in TLH, and you see the credit right here. It says, Gesang und Notenbuch. Stuttgart, 1744. So that's, that's the first way it was credited. And in the companion, the handbook to TLH, it says exactly the same thing and only that much. It's from the Gesang und Notenbuch, Stuttgart, 1744. Now, and, and that's, that's basically how it was credited in subsequent hymnal companions until C.T. Aufdenberger's companion for the hymnal Christian worship. He expands the title, give, gives a, a more complete title, Johann Georg Christian Ströhl's Schlag, Gesang und Notenbuch, Stuttgart, 1744. Now this book, originally uh, put together, edited, composed, compiled by Johann Georg Ströhl, uh, by the time it reached, reached its third edition in 1744, the third edition was edited by Johann Georg Stutzel. So we need to keep our Johann Georgs straight. Stirl had died. Stutzel took over and um, prepared this third edition in 1744. There was another edition in 1777. And so we fully expected, we've identified the book, get a facsimile of it, get a copy of it, find um, O Grosser Gott, we're, we are good to go. Problem. The tune is not in the book. It simply isn't there. And I don't mean to say that we went to the index and couldn't find O Grosser God and we left it at that. No, we went through every page of this book, looking at every tune, humming them, playing them. This is not it. This is not it. This doesn't even look like it. And did that again with the 1777 edition. We're not sure where this TLH attribution to the Gesang und Notenbuch, Stuttgart 1744 comes from, or what it really means, because it's not in that book. So we had to find it, we had, we had to keep looking. We found a collection from 1789 by Johann Gottfried Fierling, a Karabuch that has a tune that is sort of like the one that appears in TLH. Here's what the original source looks like. In our companion, we um, transpose them and lay out Fearling's 1789 tune on the top and the LSB tune in C major underneath so you can compare the phrases. So let's just look at phrase one. Bum, 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 bum. All right, except for uh, having an extra syllable in the first line, I would say, I would say that matches. Phrase two, similar, phrase three, etc. You can go through, look at the whole thing. Um, it's clear that Fearling's tune is a model for the tune in LSB, but it's not exactly the same thing. we were able to find a few more, let's just call them models or intermediary models between Fearling and TLH, where the tune gets a little closer, a little closer to as it appears in TLH, but we have yet to find something earlier than TLH that has this tune as it appears in TLH. Let me say that again. The earliest source with this tune as it appears in TLH, is TLH. It's worth mentioning at this point that this tune wasn't even the first choice tune for this text in TLH. 
1938, at the Synod Convention, the Committee on Hymnology and Liturgics uh, prepared a report for that convention in 1938, and there it listed that the text, O God of God, O Light of Light, would go with the tune Jordan by Joseph Barnby. And then in the committee's final report in 1939, it said the same thing. This text would be paired with Jordan by Joseph Barnby. Um, incidentally, that same text tune pairing, O God of God, O Light of Light, and Jordan, you can find in the Episcopal Hymnal of 1916. When did they decide to use the other tune? Now, we went to the W.G. Pollock papers. Pollock was the chairman of the committee that prepared TLH. He was basically its editor, and he was also the author of its companion, its handbook. And in his papers at Concordia Historical Institute, we were able to see this typewritten page with his handwriting notes regarding what would appear in TLH. And so we see here the typewritten text of O God of God, O Light of Light, and then his notes all around it. This bottom portion here, I've uh, zoomed in, in the, the detail, and you can see that the author of the text is listed J. Julian, John Julian. And originally the tune was going to be Jordan, composed by Joseph Barnby. That's crossed out and written in Pollock's hand, O Grosser Gott, Peren, 1744, ST, Choralbuch. We think it's ST, ST period. It's kind of hard to read his writing. Um, so that 1744 ST could be Stuttgart, could be Stutzel, could be Stirl, but based on his notes, what made it onto the page in TLH and in its companion was Gesang und Notenbuch, Stuttgart 1744. So we wonder, where does the tune come from? Where does it come from before TLH? And where does this, where does this credit come from? What does this credit mean? Okay, so there are a couple possible answers to that question. One, least, and this is the least likely answer, I think. Maybe 1744 ST Karabuch is pointing to a different source from 1744, an unidentified source from them, and that that tune from 1744 was the model for Fearling in 1789. This is highly unlikely. As I said, Fearling's model was kind of here, and then other subsequent um, intermediary models we found get slightly closer and slightly closer to the form that appears in TLH. It seems unlikely that the form that appears in TLH would have been up here, drifted apart as a model and then started drifting back. It's, it's, it's pretty unlikely. A second answer to the question, what is the source that TLH used? Maybe one of those interme intermediary models we found is what the editors of TLH were using and they adapted it into its present form. This is also unlikely because Pollock probably would have said so in his companion and it definitely doesn't explain this credit that we see here, O Grosser God, 1744. So what we think is the most likely explanation, this is, uh, this is our best guess at this point, is that there is some un unidentified hymnal or karabuch from the late 19th or early 20th centuries, which adapted further one of those models, bringing it really close or exactly to what the form that would appear in TLH and that book erroneously cited it to 1744 Stuttgart Choralbuch. Um, I don't think that Pollock had that Choralbuch available to him to look at it. And it's very possible if there was 
some, some hymnal in between, those editors wouldn't have had it either. So I'm, I'm imagining, um, I'm imagining them looking for another tune and saying, ha having some book in front of them and saying, yeah, let's use this tune, jotting down the information from there, even though it was wrong information. So here's another assignment for you. Um, see if you can find the tune as it appears in TLH in any book before TLH. Let us know. Now, as promised, I said we would talk about some of the settings from TLH. Um, how many settings from TLH are used in LSB? Let's look at a page from the LSB index of composers of tunes and settings. Now, I don't know how well you can make out the detail, but I think the point is plain. Um, so for example, service book and hymnal here, these are settings from service book and hymnal or Ray Fawn Williams, some settings and tunes here. Now here's TLH, this huge block of them. The vast majority of settings that appear in LSB come from TLH. And this was really intentional. Um, the settings that were in LW in 1982 weren't, weren't very well received, probably for two reasons. Um, people found them difficult to play and they really liked the, the settings from TLH that fit nicely under your hands. I don't mean they're simple or easy or something like that, but they're very straightforward. They fit nicely under the hands. They missed those settings from TLH and they also missed the four part settings that could be used for singing in four parts. So with Lutheran Service Book, the hymnody committee and the Commission on Worship very intentionally wanted to use a lot of the familiar settings from TLH specifically for those reasons. They fit nicely under the hands and people can sing them in four parts, whether congregation, choir, at home, whatever. So as you can see, there are a ton of settings in LSB that come from TLH. But with our companion, we wanted to know where do these settings really come from? Are they really all from TLH? Are they all prepared by Bernhard Schumacher? Or do they come, come from other places? Well, of, of course, as far as we can tell, some of them do come from TLH, or we haven't found them in any, any previous books yet. But many of them come from elsewhere. Two sources that were significant sources of the settings in TLH, and therefore uh, in LSB, are these two Karabuchs, H.F. Holter's Karabuch from 1886 and Karl Brauer's Karabuch from 1888. Now, as I said earlier, even by 1883, other publishers were, were doing these Karabuchs um, and CPH didn't, didn't publish their first one until 1886. Remember that at the time, our German hymnal, you know, the, the, the little hymnal was just text. There was no music in it. So the organist played from these korabus that had the tunes and the settings. Now, why did CPH publish a korabu for its German hymnal in 1886 and then do one again with a different editor just two years later? That is an excellent question, but it is a question for another day. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a longer topic but an interesting one. In any case, these Karabuchs ended up being the source of nine settings, Holter's, Holter's Karabuch, the source of nine settings that appear in LSB, many of them used more than once, and Brower's, the source of four settings. Now, these guys, Holter and Brower, and others were um, sometimes getting their sources from up from earlier, or, um, getting them from earlier sources, um, getting their settings from earlier sources. Sometimes they were arranging them. Some, sometimes they were composing them. It's hard to say, but we can keep tracing back earlier and earlier sources. And one of the most important, maybe the most important composer of the settings 
that appear in Lutheran Service Book has heretofore been uncredited for doing that. And he is Friedrich Leiritz. Friedrich Leiritz lived in Germany from 1808 to 1859, and he was a leading figure in restoring the Lutheran chorale. And what does that mean? Um, again, it's a, a, a longer subject, so, something, something good for, for another day. Um, the, the prominence of the Lutheran chorale and the way it was sung had really lost place in the Lutheran church. And he wanted to see it restored to its original form and its, and its prominence in the service. He advocated for returning to using the rhythmic forms of the chorales. So take a look at A Mighty Fortress in Lutheran Service Book at numbers 656 and 657 and compare those two different versions of the tune. The original version of the tune, the rhythmic version, um, is more rugged and um, which is more rhythmic. The later version of the tune is smoother. The, ryth the ryth rhythms have kind of been taken out of it. Um, and Lyritz was a leading advocate for returning to the original forms of these chorales. And so he published numerous books, collections of these chorale tunes that he had assembled from 16th and 17th century sources. And maybe most importantly, he was making available with those classic Lutheran tunes, he was making available four part settings of these chorales, settings that fit nicely under the hands and could be sung, could be sung in four parts. One of his most important collections and one from which we get many settings in LSB is his collection of 200, 200 chorales, just as one example, just one of many. You can see here in this book, the tune and his setting for soul adorn yourself with gladness. Now in LSB, it's in D major and here it's in E flat major, but if you compare them, you'll see they're really, really similar. And we have Lyritz to thank for this familiar, even beloved setting that we still play and sing today. Now, I showed you the index from the page in LSB, the hymnal itself with all of those, all of those settings credited to TLH. Back in LSB, if you look up Lyritz, you will see that he gets one thing credited to him in LSB. And that's not even a setting or a tune. It's the text for stanza three of Lo How a Rose Air Blooming. Not even the whole hymn. He gets one stanza. That was the entirety of, of the credit he got in LSB. Now with our companion that we've gone further back, we looked at all of those settings in TLH and then looked back in the previous chorale books, looked back in Lyritz's book, we have identified 36 settings that should be attributed to Lyritz. This is the majority of the familiar classic Lutheran chorale settings that we still sing and play today, credited to Lyritz. I hope you enjoyed uh, coming on this little journey with me, taking, uh, taking a look at these historical highlights. As you can see, we went to really great lengths and spend a lot of time investigating the earliest sources of everything in Lutheran Service Book. And we really did try to examine as many primary sources as we could. And the result is a hymnal companion that is more reliable. I think we have set the new standard for the reliability of information in hymnal companions, definitely. But I, hope, I also hope that the, the digging that we did and the things that we've uncovered um, 
I hope that you will enjoy reading about it in the companion. Um, there are a lot of fascinating details in there. I only really scratched the surface in this video. Um, I hope you enjoy it, but I also hope that you find it fun. Um, we, we did, we, we found it a lot of fun to dig into these stories and, and find these things. Um, and I hope that you do too. Enjoy your new hymnal companion.